Good afternoon, and welcome to the Meet Your Neighborhood National Labs event. Uh, my name is Ian Adams. I'm a managing director from Clean Energy Trust. We're hosting today's event, and I'll be moderating today's conversation with uh, the fine folks from Argonne and Fermi Labs. So we're going to get started very shortly, but just before we do, let me just make a couple notes. Uh, BlueJeans, uh, which is the platform we're using, works best in the Chrome browser. So if you're using another browser, you may want to reconnect with Chrome. Also, when you joined, uh, your video and audio were automatically turned off. So if you don't mind keeping those off during our presentation, that'll make things easier and cleaner for everyone. Uh, to ask questions throughout the meeting, uh, use the chat function, which is the second icon uh, at the top right of the section of your screen. You can put questions in at any time, and we'll either uh, chat answers to you or uh, tee them up as part of the conversation. Uh, and if you have a long question and you'd like to just chat it in person uh, in the Q&A section at the end of the conversation, you can let us know that in the chat as well. Okay, so I think those are the housekeeping things. Uh, let's flip over to the next slide and touch on our agenda and do a quick round of introductions. So we're going to introduce ourselves and I'll talk a little bit about the work that Clean Energy Trust does. Then we're going to hear from John and Mauricio to provide an overview of Argon and Fermilabs, and then uh, from Polina to talk through how companies can engage with the labs before we open it up to a Q&A. So first things first, um, can we do a quick round of introductions? As I said, my name is Ian Adams. I'm Managing Director with uh, Clean Energy Trust. And then uh, John, Mauricio, and Polina, do you want to give, introduce yourselves? Sure, sure. So again, my name is John Harvey. I'm a, a business development executive in our science and technology partnerships and outreach at Argonne National Lab. And should I go? My name is Mauricio Suarez. Um, I'm the deputy head of, uh, of technology development and industry engagement at Fermilab. Hi, I'm Paulina Rachinkova. I'm like John, a business development executive uh, at Argonne and the science and Technology Partnerships and Outreach Director. Wonderful, thanks everyone. All right, let's jump into the content. We can talk through uh, Clean Energy Trust Works real quick and then uh, move on to learn more about the labs. So could we hop to the next slide, please? So Clean Energy Trust uh, helps support early stage companies in the Midwest, uh, providing capital, catalytic capital and support. And we invest in very early stage companies working on sustainability solutions, decarbonization, and things of that sort. Next slide, please. We've been uh, around since uh, 2010 and really work across the region uh, to help uh, support the clean tech ecosystem and to support uh, clean tech startups. Next slide. We work across, when you hear clean tech, environmental sustainability, decarbonization, climate tech, we're across that space, across materials, electricity, energy, storage, water, ag tech, transportation, all that good stuff. So although energy is in our name, we take a, a broad view there. And a lot of the companies that we work with are developing uh, you know, innovative uh, physical technologies. Next slide, please. So the way that we typically work is what we call our 501 VC model. So Clean Energy Trust is structured as a nonprofit, but we make investments in early stage companies, much like a venture capital firm. But the dollars that we uh, invest come from philanthropic sources. So that enables us with our model to take a little bit more risk and help support companies as they work to develop their businesses and help them reach critical milestones so they can then uh, go out into the market and raise dollars from more traditional investors. All right, uh, next slide, please. So we've been making investments since 2014. Uh, we've made uh, investments in 35 clean tech startups from across the region in a bunch of different categories. Uh, and when these companies are successful, we that take those dollars, reinvest them into our fund, and then are able to invest in new companies. Next slide. So we are happy to support the companies and really the ecosystem in general. Uh, a lot of what we're doing, like I said, is you know providing support to these very early stage companies, helping them get to that next stage. So we're really proud that for every dollar that Clean Energy Trust invests, uh, those companies go on to raise $26 of funding subsequently. 
that we're not the largest check writer, but we try to be a helpful one. Uh, and then also really proud that 60% uh, of the companies we've invested in have female or minority founders. And I think that comes from, partially it comes from our open process. So anyone can apply to the uh, Clean Energy Trust 501 VC fund at cleanenergytrust.org slash apply. And we're always interested in chatting further. Uh, I think that's all I have. So now uh, we can hop on to the next slide and I'd like to turn things over to John Harvey. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, and thank you everybody for taking the time to uh, to meet with us a little bit today. So again, uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the Department of Energy, just very briefly, uh, since they, uh, they, they uh, own the national labs. And then a little overview of Argonne. Uh, I'll pass it on to Mauricio to talk about Fermilab. And then Paulina will come on to do the exciting part, which is, okay, how do I actually engage with the labs uh, and work with them going forward? Uh, next slide, please. So this is, this is a, the mission statement for the Department of Energy. So, uh, you know, again, it really is all about looking at the energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges, and how do we how do we go after all of those with with science and technology solutions through the through the national labs? Next slide, please. Uh, some people may not know the Department of Energy actually has 17 national labs across the country. Um, you can see those represented here in the map. Um, they're sort of separated depending on who the primary funder of those labs are. So there's some that are uh, very specifically focused. So uh, in red, you'll see Nettle, uh, which is a fossil energy. So they're focused on the fossil energy space. Uh, Idaho National Lab out there in purple is uh, a, a nuclear lab. So they're, they're you know, really focused on nuclear engineering, uh, nuclear power um, from that standpoint. And the three labs in sort of the yellowish gold are, uh, are in the national securities, the nuclear national security space. So think of them as the folks that are in charge of all of our nuclear weapons that are out there uh, and amongst many other things. But the bulk of the labs, including both uh, Fermi and Argonne are funded by the Office of Science, which is really about open science and, and general science, um, you know, furthering, furthering the boundaries of science. Next slide, please. Um, one of the great things is from you, you saw from that last map is there's 17 across the entire country. There happen to be two within, you know, 40 miles of downtown Chicago. Um, so, you know, both Argonne and Fermilab right here in, in the, you know, in, in the backyard of Chicago is, uh, is, is a great benefit, uh, we think obviously to the, you know, to the science and engineering that we can bring to the to the region, partnering with you know folks like yourselves as well as the wonderful universities around in the area as well. Next slide, please. So the labs have a rich history. Uh, this is a an image of of uh, Enrico Fermi, is the the second gentleman from the right, and this is celebrating the fact that they. Uh, created the first self-sustaining chain reaction uh, for nuclear chain reaction. Famous story is they did it underneath the football field at the University of Chicago uh, in a squash court uh, in, uh, in, um, in uh, 1946, I guess it would be. So, and uh, the university president came to him after the fact and said, this is great, but maybe not in the middle of the city. So. They went out to the country at the time, and that's where Argonne got its start. Um, so we will be celebrating 75 years uh, in, uh, in just starting in just a couple months. And then obviously Fermilab is, uh, is an homage to, to Enrico Fermi as well. Next slide, please. So now just a quick overview on Argonne. Next slide. So, you know, at a, at a very high level, and these numbers are actually, I need to update these. So Argonne's a little over a, a billion dollar uh, lab today uh, with most of the funding coming from the Department of Energy, but also uh, we do engage with a number of companies, large and small, uh, which Melina will talk a little bit more on uh, later. 
Uh, we have a little over 3,000 full-time employees plus you know, a bunch of postdoctoral researchers. And one of the things that I'm, I'm gonna touch on here this morning, or the, at the beginning of this, is we have what's called user facilities that you as a user, whether you're an industry user, an academic, uh, or other national labs, can come and actually use facilities at the lab. And we host roughly, on a normal year, uh, we host roughly 8,000 uh, facility users throughout the year. This year obviously has not been quite as normal as we would all like it to be. Um, we, we, we have researchers in just about every discipline of science and engineering that you can imagine. So, you know, whether your interests are in, you know, sort of battery technologies or renewable energy, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of solar, wind, bio, nuclear, you know, any of those types of things, hydrogen fuel cell space, um, automation, um, you know, environmental and how do the energy and our environment work together, hopefully to find those win-wins. Uh, and then most recently, which we can talk about a little bit more on the question side of things, uh, is quantum. And that's something that both uh, Argon and, and Fermi are very excited uh, to, uh, to, to host two of the five brand new quantum centers that the Department of Energy has just uh, started funding. Um, next slide, please. So Argon works across the entire value chain, which, which really helps us engage with industry. So all the way from materials discovery, characterization, and all the way through to, you know, really looking at recycling. We just stood up, the Department of Energy just stood up a center at, uh, at Argon a couple of years ago called Resell, which is actually looking at the end of life of lithium ion batteries and how do we recycle and reuse as much of that uh, material as possible. Next slide, please. So again, Argon works in a lot of different disciplines. This is one way that we try to sort of capture big picture of you know some of the big activities that we're focused on uh, currently. So uh, hard X-ray imaging, or what we call the advanced photon source, uh, advanced computing. So we have some of the most powerful uh, supercomputers in the world, uh, materials and chemistry. So, you know, that's really where we got our start and we're continuing to focus a lot of our energy. Uh, the universe is our lab. So really answering those mind boggling questions of how did this all start? <laughs> you know, those types of things. Um, and then really um, manufacturing science and engineering. And that's tied a lot to the, you know, sort of the future of manufacturing in the U.S. and how do we bring manufacturing back to the U.S.? Um, you know, our hypothesis is, um, you know, how do we make manufacturing as intelligent as possible to, to you know, improve efficiencies and those types of things uh, in that space? Next slide, please. So now I just want to briefly talk on a, a couple of the, the user facilities. Uh, so again, uh, the advanced photon source is the brightest X-rays in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, roughly think of them about a billion times brighter than your dental X-rays that you get. So why do you need X-rays that bright? What does it really do for you? So think about things like, oh, something topical like, you know, there happens to be a virus that's out there right now. And I can actually use these X-rays to look into the virus and understand what's happening at the protein level, for instance. or um, I'm trying to understand combustion inside of a jet engine and what's happening at the fuel injector part of that combustor. I can actually look into that and see what's happening at that liquid gas interface, uh, for instance. Next slide, please. You know, and here's an example of how, how a company actually leveraged uh, the advanced photon source. So, so Plexicon is a quasi, they, they've now bought, been sold a pharmaceutical company that was really looking at uh, trying to understand uh, skin cancers. And they came and used APS to, to you know, do a lot of the research and understand what's happening, you know, sort of at that protein level and actually ended up creating a drug uh, for this that was approved by the FDA in 2011. Um, and then, you know, turned around and were able to sell that drug uh, to another company for, I think it was on the order of about 800 uh, million-ish dollars 
in uh, in the 2011 timeframe. So that's a perfect example of, you know, small company obviously doesn't have the money to build their own advanced photon source, but can come and leverage this uh, this tool to help them out. One of the great things about the user facilities is if you're willing to share your science, um, you can use it completely for free. It's, it's a service that's provided by the Department of Energy. If you want to keep your information proprietary, uh, like a drug company, for instance, that may be trying to develop a new drug, what you do is you actually pay for the cost recovery. So the costs that go into using the beams and the, the personnel for the time you have it, uh, which is a great, uh, a great model. Next slide, please. Uh, the next user facility is what we call our Argon Leadership Computing Facility. So again, this is some of the, you know, Argon houses some of the most powerful uh, supercomputers on the planet uh, in open science. Uh, we're in the process of, of actually building what will be the, one of the first, what they call exascale computers. So exascale is, you know, 100 times 10 to the ninth. No, yeah, 10 to the ninth operations per second. A lot. So... Um, and why do you need computers this big? So think of, think of, I'm trying to do a global model on the climate and understand what's happening with climate over the next 20, 50, 100 years um, from, phys from physics-based modeling um, and try to do that at a scale that actually matters, right? So can I do that to, you know, within, you know, tens of kilometers so that I can actually truly see what's happening within a region or a city? Um, can I, for instance, map the human brain and understand what's happening at every uh, cell inside of the human brain so we can maybe get a, a, a better understanding of what's causing things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, those types of things? Um, or can I use this to look at the billions and billions of possibilities for, you know, um, antivirals for, you know, for a virus that may be out there that we're all trying to conquer? Um, and use machine learning uh, to help, you know, chug through a bunch of those and find what we think are the best uh, options in those cases. Next slide, please. This is another example of, of, a, of a small business that tapped into a user facility. So TAE Technologies um, is looking at sort of a new source in clean energy. Uh, again, didn't have, doesn't have the tools or this, you know, to be able to do these very large, very complex calculations, and have been able to tap into the computing facility to to really help with accelerator and plasma physics, um, and and helped with a lot of inventions that they've been able to make specifically to their world, and also that they've been able to uh, share with others in uh, in sort of satellite spaces as well. Next slide, please. And the, the final user facility I want to just touch on is what we call our Center for Nanoscale Materials. Um, sort of speaks for itself. So really looking at, uh, you know, the nanoscale. And again, one of the great things about this facility is we have, uh, we have about a, um, I think it's a little over a 17,000 square foot clean room, class 1000 to class 100 clean room, that, you know, you as a user can actually come in and, you know, do some experiments, do some some actual, you know, nanoscale manufacturing and fail fast in that environment so you can learn and now, you know, go off and do other things. Um, and it's, you know, houses some of the one, most, you know, cutting edge tools and, um, you know, brightest people in this space that work with you to help, you know, sort of characterize and understand what's happening in those uh, in those areas. Next slide, please. Um, and here's a nice example, and, and you saw that this company's name on, uh, on one of Ian's slides as well. Uh, this is this is uh, a company we like to talk about because of it uh, sort of started, left, and came back. Iris Light Technologies uh, is uh, came out of out of uh, somebody that was actually a postdoc in in the Center for Nanoscale Manufacturing. Um, came up with some really great ideas for for silicon laser technology. Um, and now has spun that company out of the lab uh, and actually now is engaged with the lab using, using this user facility uh, and using another, uh, another model that, that um, Paulina will talk about in a little bit as well. 
to really come around and hopefully bring this amazing technology to uh, you know to the real world in the in the not too distant future. Next slide, please. You know, just just very quickly, we do work with a lot of different companies in a lot of different sectors because we're you know sort of a multifaceted laboratory, um, big and small. So so you know, again, you may be you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, but you may not necessarily have the world's largest supercomputer or an advanced photon source or all of the tools that, that the lab has in nanoscale materials. So that's a great way to sort of supplement what you're doing uh, in, in, this, in this space. Next slide, please. Uh, and then just really quickly, just because of obviously it's top of mind and unfortunately it's becoming more top of mind yet again, uh, I was kind of hoping that this topic would go away, uh, but uh, just to show a little bit of what the lab's doing, obviously we're not a medical lab, that's not our focus in life, but we do partner with you know, the experts in, in the medical field to look at these types of things. So again, we can look at the protein structure using our advanced photon source. We can use artificial intelligence and our giant uh, supercomputers to, to look at workflows and look at possible therapies in that space. Uh, next slide, please. We have some folks that have, that have really developed what's called agent-based modeling. So they can look at you know, a city, say, say Chicago, and understand how people interact in the city of Chicago and what would we do to try to mitigate the spread of, of a virus, right? You know, sort of thinking about things like wearing masks and, you know, sort of staying, you know, social distancing and all of those things that, you know, we're all talking about now are really informed by looking at these types of models. Uh, and then finally, we have a group that's really focused on uh, resiliency and trying to understand, you know, how do I, how do I plan for something like a pandemic? How do I deal with a pandemic as it's happening? And then how do I recover from something like a pandemic after hopefully someday when we all go back to whatever the new normal will be? Um, and, and really looking at those types of things and working with decision makers to help give them um, actionable information for those, those questions. Next slide, please. Great, and I will uh, like to hand it now over to uh, Mauricio in the Fermilab. Thank you very much, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let me talk, and I'll be doing a little bit of compare and contrast with Argon. As John mentioned, um, uh, we are like 30 miles northwest uh, to Argon. We're over at Batavia, Batavia, Illinois. We are around half, right now it's probably around 500 million a year budget, and we have around um, 1,800 uh, staff at Fermilab. So we're around half the size uh, of Argon. Um, we have uh, many collaborations and in a particular day you may find um, around 4,800 um, staff and, and partners over uh, in the campus. Um, even though we are around half the size of, of, uh, of Argon, we have a, a, a larger uh, real, estate, real estate footprint. We have um, 6,800 acres um, that include a restored prairie and, and bike paths, and you can come in, uh, in the non-COVID times um, with your smart ID, you can come in uh, and, and look at the bison. Um, compared to, to Argon, we're a single purpose. We're not a, a, a multi-purpose lab. With the, we are a single purpose lab. And our purpose is to be America's particle physics and accelerator uh, laboratory. Uh, next slide, please. So talk about uh, uh, particle physics. I want to highlight some of the projects that we're very excited about. If you want to learn about what's going on today, uh, maybe you can uh, Google Muon or, or, or Dark, uh, Dark Matter and Fermilab and you'll get some uh, very cool stories. But today I want to highlight what we're preparing uh, to be. We're preparing to be um, a world-leading neutrino uh, facility and there are 
three um, uh, facilities that are being put into place. One is uh, PIP2, the, the Proton Impro Improvement Plan, um, LBNF, and DUNE, the Deep Underground uh, Neutrino Experiment. So we're, um, what we're creating is going to be a very strong uh, neutrino beam that is going to leave uh, Batavia, Illinois, and will be captured um, in South Dakota at the San Sanford uh, Underground Research Facility, where there will be this uh, huge uh, Olympic pool size um, detectors that will uh, detect the neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos are the most abundant uh, particles in the universe, and we believe they hold a lot of clues about mysteries. Uh, for example, um, if, um, if you think about the Big Bang and when matter was created, you expect around the same amount of matter to be created than antimatter. Um, if that was the case, then we wouldn't be here. So there's some, there has to be some type of symmetry breaking, and we believe that the neutrinos hold some uh, of the clues to find out why, why we're here. Um, and there are a lot of other, other mysteries that we believe neutrinos will help us elucidate. Uh, so I think that what, for the next 10 years or so, uh, Fermilab will be uh, a world leader in, in neutrino research. Um, next slide, please. Um, so on the accelerator part, um, you know, what do we do? Um, we, we are a science facility and, um, and with that, we, we, we also need to be at the top notch of uh, different type of technologies. Of, co of course, particle accelerators is one of those technologies. We have to be world leaders, but also magnets. Um, we need to, um, create uh, beams of particles and we need to guide them around and focus them. So for that, we need super uh, conducting magnets and then we need uh, detectors. Um, so what we do is we create these um, beams of particles that are very close to the speed of light. And then we in either crash them into a detector or um, crash them with another beam of, of particles. And this create a millions um, of, of, uh, of, of events per second. And you have, um, again, millions of detectors around that will detect terabytes amounts of data. So um, we need to have the, you know, top-notch technology on particle accelerators, computing magnets and, and detectors. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, IARC at Fermilab. IARC at Fermilab is the commercialization arm of, of Fermi. We are around eight um, engineers, scientists, and business development people that were looking at how to um, reach um, outside the walls of Fermilab and making sure that the awesome uh, technology and science that is being created at Fermilab reaches outside of our walls. IARC um, is around five years old. Uh, it started as the Illinois Accelerator uh, Research Center. Right now we're more than that, so we're just called IARC at this time. Um, so what one, some of the things that we do, we have a, an e-beam application um, expl exploration facility that I will describe a little bit later. Then we're also uh, uh, development, development, de developing uh, core technology. So we're developing a, a, a superconducting RF electron accelerator, a compact accelerator. Right now, um, electron accelerators have a very varied uh, industrial uses, but the core technology that, that this industrial accelerator use, um, use um, copper technology, uh, technology that was developed around 40, 40, 50 years ago. Um, obviously, the, the large accelerators that are being used um, for places like Fermilab or CERN um, have advanced a lot. Um, superconductivity, um, it's uh, used amply. And we believe that there is room 
for these core technologies that are being developed to be um, implemented in, in, in industry, especially in the compact accelerator. Uh, we're also exploring um, other areas like AI um, on the edge to see if we can find commercial applications of these, uh, of these technologies that are being used at the lab. Um, another thing that, that, that we engage is um, meant um, entrepreneurship um, in, in, in the lab so that our scientists and engineers um, engage and collaborate uh, closer with uh, startups and industry partners. Uh, next slide, please. So um, a little bit about the applications of electron uh, accelerator. So we're uh, looking at medical sterilization. We have been um, organizing workshops for electron beam for uh, medical sterilization equipment. Um, and and the, the intent there, right now, electron um, accelerators and actuaries are probably only around 5% um, to maybe 8% of, of the market, of the medical sterilization market. Um, Cobalt-60 is, is used uh, a lot, it's probably around 50% of the market. And there is interest to reduce uh, the reliance uh, on radioactive material. So um, I think it would be great uh, for many purposes uh, to, to reduce the, that, that, that reliance. Um, we're also looking at uh, treating uh, municipal uh, waste and sludge and um, breaking up recalcitrant contaminants uh, like uh, perfluoro, uh, perfluorinated um, alkyl uh, substances um, and, and more uh, futuristic uh, applications um, uh, could be the, you know, the cross -link linking in pavements, um, prove, uh, improve the non-invasive inspection of cargo containers and additive manufacturing refractory metals. Uh, next slide, please. So at Fermilab, we have um, a LINAC, linear uh, electron accelerator, uh, that is a nine um, MEVs up to 1.2 kilowatts um, uh, electron accelerator that is available uh, to use with partners. We've used it um, in, with, with internal partners over at Fermilab. Uh, we'll, we have used it other, um, also with, with other national lab. Uh, universities and, and, and industry. Um, for example, we have um, a, a water facility uh, uh, in Chicago um, that, that uh, we partner with to look at, at breaking some of the contaminants in water. Um, if you believe you have a, a, a possible use for uh, a, an electron accelerator to break a contaminant, to cross-link a polymer, um, or any new use that you would like to explore, please give us a call. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, there are other um, test user facilities at, at Fermilab. They're um, concentrated on accelerator uh, facilities, for example, the the IOTA, which is Interval Optics Test Accelerator. Uh, there's a test beam facility. Um, if you believe there, you might have a use with, with um, things that are related with accelerators or with anything that I mentioned above, you know, uh, superconducting magnets, uh, uh, high uh, computing uh, facilities, um, give us a call. And if it's not a Fermilab that can work with you, we'll uh, talk also with our uh, colleagues at other national uh, laboratories to see if we can help you. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, I would like to highlight how we work or how we have worked um, with with different uh, with different partners. Um, some su uh, success stories, if you want. So at the very top left, you have Natural Science LLC. Um, this is a startup where um, a scientist at Fermilab um, thought about a way to use magnetic materials uh, to, to pull oil together um, in the surface of a, an aqueous uh, system, for example, at the surface of a river or our oceans. Um, so oil spills 
uh, were in his mind when he developed this. So the, the patent he uh, licensed, the, the patent uh, from Furman Lab, uh, got funding, uh, created a prototype, and, and I think they're, they're doing a great job uh, pushing that, that technology into the market. Um, in the center, we have a radio beam at Northern um, Illinois uh, University um, developed a nanocathode uh, technology that um, for um, for electron gun um, for being able to supply electrons into the accelerators, and that uh, technology we hope will um, replace the technology that is now used uh, used lasers that is um, costly and, and more complicated. Um, at, the, at the far right, you have enhanced semiconductors. Uh, and enhanced semiconductors is a, um, uh, a small business in Naperville, Illinois. And they have developed very um, intriguing and interesting technology in vertically integrated 3D chips. And there are some, um, there's an, an ASIC group at Fermilab, and they were um, interested in, in exploring uh, some new architectures to, some, to solve some of our problems. So through procurement uh, contract, they, they work with enhanced semiconductors um, to create uh, so, some um, uh, integrated circuits. Um, down um, in, in the bottom of the right, it's how, um, you know, the needs of the national labs can, um, can work with the needs of the nascent, uh, nascent industry. For example, in the 1970s, you have the MRI industry who had a very cool technology. Uh, science, uh, but one of the things that were needed were how to um, create reliable superconducting cables um, in, in large scale. And at that time, the Tevatron at Fermilab was uh, being constructed, and we also needed um, superconducting cable um, in, in large scale. So we worked with the industry to create the, the technology to uh, be able to produce um, these, these, these cables in a cost-effective way. And that really impulsed the, the, the industry forward. Uh, and right now it's a, a $6 billion industry. Um, in the center at the bottom, um, you have Loma Linda University. And here you have where uh, Proton uh, Fermilab created um, a, a, a proton, well, um, created a, a, a and design and build a hospital-based uh, proton therapy that is uh, used uh, in Loma Linda University Medical Center. Um, and then on the far left, um, you have um, both Horticultural West Chicago and in West Chicago, Illinois, and they've used our uh, neutron beams to alter the um, genetic material of, um, of, of flowers and and create new new phenotypes. So here um, we have a, 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 a blue uh, a blue flower plant um, that is totally new. Um, going to the again to the impact of industry, maybe I can mention something um, re, uh, regarding clean energy trust. So I've been here at Fermi Lab for around 10 months. So this happened before my time, probably around um, three or four years ago. But Fermi Lab was very interesting in exploring um, the possibility of creating a center for superconducting uh, machinery for clean energy generation. So we partner with um, CET. Um, one of the possible applications was to create a compact, a lightweight generator um, for very high fans in, in wind turbines, for example. Um, so what we wanted to create um, a, a document, a white paper that would allow us uh, to explore um, this idea with uh, funding agencies. And CET helped us do that. They also help us uh, connect with GE, with Westinghouse, and with Siemens and they coordinated uh, a workshop with Enra. Um, these type of projects, they're, they're 
you know, multi-million dollar projects, uh, uh, the, the, it takes time, probably takes 10 years or so to be, to develop a new industry pretty much. And, uh, right now the DOE Wind Energy Technology Office has released, uh, a funding opportunity announcement, um, to help support, um, the, the superconducting generator design. So we're very happy that this, that, that is moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, like, like John mentioned about COVID, COVID is, is in, in our lives right now and, 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 and also, um, uh, so want to mention that uh, Fermilab has um, high computing capabilities. So we have uh, provided more than, than at, at this point is more than 2 million core hours of computing uh, capability. Um, so that researchers can use that for modeling uh, drug protein interactions um, to narrow the search for drugs to, to fight COVID-19. And also the, the, the scientists at Fermilab partner with um, particle physicists all over the world in Italy, um, but also in, in Canada, Australia, I mean, really all over uh, to design uh, an open source ventilator. And this was, um, uh, design in, 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 you know, in probably two months work. And then the FDA approval took around six weeks. Um, and right now the, the approved, um, FDA, uh, ventilator, um, is available in Canada. Um, and next slide, please. And I'll just, um, uh, I'll, um, now it's for Polina. Uh, to, that will talk us about how to work with the with the national labs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, I will spend a few minutes uh, talking about how uh, entrepreneurs and companies can engage with national labs, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, John mentioned that one of the um, straightforward ways to start engaging with a national lab is through the user facilities that are open to researchers and industry and academia. Uh, another more traditional way uh, to engage with us is through collaborative research. We work with uh, partners in industry and academia uh, on challenges that they face and challenges that Argonne or Fermilab are uniquely positioned to address by leveraging our expertise or um, our equipment. And uh, on, uh, on the slide, you see uh, a number of bullet points listing uh, different agreement structures. So the best, not, there's no need to understand what these agreement structures are uh, because the best way to engage with us is to really reach out, sit down with us and talk through what it is that the business or technology objective um, that your company has, and then uh, understanding the nature of the project and the nature of the work that um, needs to uh, get done, we can then um, identify the most appropriate agreement structure to support that, uh, to make sure that um, the IP and data rights are allocated appropriately between partners and the national labs, um, and just to, to make sure that your business and um, technology objectives are met. Uh, annually, between Argonne and Fermilab, we engage in over 80 collaborative research projects with companies of all sizes. Uh, and uh, another way um, to collaborate with us is through technology licensing. As John mentioned, as John and Mauricio mentioned, uh, between Argonne and Fermilab, about uh, a billion and a half dollars is spent on fundamental research uh, at the two labs, and that generates significant uh, amount of innovation. And much of that, inno of that innovation is uh, protected through patenting or copyrights. And um, there's, a, there's a, a wealth of intellectual property available out there. Um, interested companies or entrepreneurs can um, learn more about what technologies are available for licensing by visiting Argonne and Fermilab uh, technology uh, transfer websites, web pages. And again, like in the case of collaborative research, if uh, a particular uh, technology uh, looks interesting um, to you or your company, the best way is to come um, and talk to us and we can uh, work together on identifying what is the appropriate next step 
whether it's uh, developing a full licensing agreement or whether it's putting an option to license in place uh, to facilitate engaging with um, small and early stage companies, Argon introduced express licensing uh, approach last year. So that's that's a way to obtain an option um, to a technology for a period of time uh, on terms that are predefined and are very entrepreneur friendly. Next slide, please. I will give two examples uh, to illustrate uh, ways that uh, we have uh, worked with companies in the past. So an illustration, probably the premier illustration of a licensing deal for Argonne is um, the work we have done with BASF. And this is around um, lithium ion batteries, specifically uh, BASF licensed um, nickel manganese cobalt um, cathode technology from Argonne. And that technology was later integrated into lithium ion batteries that power Volt and Bolt, uh, the two electric cars that were um, created by Chevy. And then next slide. An example of um, a collaborative um, research um, partnership is the master agreement that we have in place with Exelon. Exelon is, of course, a very large company, and uh, there's quite a number of different areas where Exelon's um, R&D interests overlap with Argonne's capabilities. And so by putting together a master agreement, we facilitate um, a, a very uh, fluid way for uh, the company to collaborate with various parts of the lab. And two projects illustrated here are, <clears throat> point, are um, speaking to the uh, real-time analysis of power quality. Um, for this analysis, we leverage uh, unique technology and developed at Argonne uh, uh, that, um, uh, that looks at a <clears throat> leveraging AI at the edge. And then another uh, area of collaboration that's ongoing right now is infrastructure planning uh, for uh, equitable distribution and just uh, equitable placement of uh, electronic vehicle charging stations in Chicago and the uh, immediate Chicago suburbs. Next slide, please. I'd like to mention uh, some DOE programs, Department of Energy programs that are maybe particularly relevant to this audience today. Uh, these are programs that are uh, targeted at entrepreneurs and um, startup companies. The SBIR, um, uh, Small Business Innovation Research Grant, is something that many of you are probably familiar with, but uh, you may not know that um, DOE National Labs actually are um, allowed and encouraged to work with companies that receive SBIR or STTR grants um, and uh, wish to leverage uh, some of uh, the unique capabilities that the lab ha labs have. Um, and uh, between Argonne and Fermilab, we engage in about two dozen SBIR uh, collaborations a year with small companies. Another example of our Department of Energy program is Technology Commercialization Fund. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's a different program where uh, the funds are actually uh, being paid to the national lab, but the national lab uh, collaborates with a company, whether it's a small business or, or an established company, on solving um, the problem that's particularly relevant to the partner. So in a way, uh, while the monies do not flow from DOE to the business, uh, the business gets a leverage on its um, kind of R&D investiture by working with the lab and leveraging DOE funds that way. And uh, we, um, we engage in about um, eight to 12 such collaborations a year. Another example of a program is a pretty unique program on it's called Chain Reaction Innovations. It's programs. There's two other similar programs um, across the nations in California and in Tennessee. Uh, but for CRI, this program is truly unique, and we've we've had tremendous success with this. Uh, I think we are in the process of uh, accepting applications for the sixth uh, CRI cohort of entrepreneurs. Under this program, um, a, a, an entrepreneur or company uh, working in areas um, that um, are that can leverage resources that are gone and um, 
research expertise at Argonne uh, apply, and they, if they receive the grant, the CRI grant, that in fact um, the salary of the lead researcher from the company is covered by uh, the Department of Energy funding for two years. The, the researcher is embedded um, within Argonne's um, research group and is assigned a uh, partner at Argonne, a research partner at Argonne, to effectively, again, um, work on uh, the company's R&D challenge. So that's a, that's a pretty attractive program, and we've had uh, good successes with that program. Next slide, please. I will wrap up with an example of a partnership that um, exemplifies a DOE-funded program. Um, this is um, this is a program uh, called um, High Performance Computing for Energy Innovations, and this is um, uh, funded by DOE and encourages companies, uh, large or small, to leverage our, uh, to leverage DOE's uh, supercomputing resources. As um, John mentioned, Argon uh, Leadership Computing Facility um, is one such um, supercomputing user facility. And so in this example, um, our uh, researchers at Argonne partnered with a company based in Wisconsin, Convergent Science, and a local company, startup company called Parallel Works, local to Chicago, um, to apply uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics methods to uh, engine modeling. They've modeled different types of engines. They've also developed uh, additional tools to uh, ensure that such simulations worked very effectively on high performance computing infrastructures. And they've also developed um, AI and machine learning approaches to, again, accelerate the simulations and achieve better results. And the focus um, here was on uh, designing uh, engines that would uh, have increased efficiency and decreased emissions. And with that, um, next uh, slide, please. Um, I'd like to wrap up. Um, uh, these are contact emails that would re reach um, the individuals that presented today. Uh, we'd like to encourage everybody uh, who is on this call, if you have a specific question or a request, please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, one of us will get back to you. Let me hand it, hand it over to Ian. Thank you so much, Paulina. Uh, that was great, and, and thanks to uh, John and Mauricio as well. You know, uh, John mentioned Iris Light Technologies earlier, and then uh, Polina mentioned the Chain Reaction Innovations Program, and that was one of the programs that uh, Iris Light was a participant in, and now an investor, uh, rather a uh, company that Clean Energy Trust has invested in. So great example of research coming out of lab, going through national lab programming, uh, working with other ecosystem entities, uh, and that's one thing we love to see here in the ecosystem. So. Now we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, feel free to tee those questions up in the chat box. While you're doing that, uh, why don't I get things uh, started? Um, how would someone, if they were interested in learning about what technologies might be available for licensing, uh, how would they go about like learning what's out there and what, what technology might be available? Uh, that's, that's a great question. You know, again, the easiest way is to reach out to those emails that we just put on there. The other second easiest way is you can go to uh, either of the websites and uh, under Argon, for instance, if you there's a section about doing business with the lab and there's a pull down of available technologies uh, as well. But feel free to reach out via email and we can point you in the right directions for sure. Fantastic. And um... Uh, Paulina, you mentioned uh, the coll potential collaboration for SBI awards. Like, at, at what? Obviously, that's like an application process, and there's I know there's a long timeline there. At what point should uh, a company engage with a lab if they're looking into that um, when they when it comes to thinking about an SBI application? That's an excellent question, Ian, and a pertinent one. So, uh, the the company thinking of applying for an SBI or STTR grant should contact um, the lab early in the process before they submit the application. And the reason that is, um, is because Argon would then need to internally develop uh, a budget and approve a budget for the sub award for the SBIR. So that approved budget is something that the Department of Energy would wish to see as part of the application. Wonderful. 
All right, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Stefan. We've got uh, for Argon, uh, See, this is for, oh, I'm sorry, for Argon. So for John, uh, waste commission, decommissioning is a huge industry. Uh, have you engaged with any companies in that space? The short answer is yes. <laughs> the longer answer is I don't have all of the details and I'd love to talk to, talk to you more about it, Stephen. So please, again, reach out via email and, and we can talk about it in, in more detail. Great, and just a reminder, folks, feel free to throw your questions into the chat here and we will get to them. And Ian, um, there was a question about uh, waste management and nuclear. So one of the things we're exploring is um, one type of waste that, that, that is very difficult to handle is the mixed waste. So you have you know, an aqueous uh, stream that is uh, contaminated uh, with ra radioactive material, but also some organic materials. So we're exploring if we can eliminate the organic um, materials with an electron beam and just keep it as a radioactive waste instead of a mixed waste. Um, and, and it seems some people are interested in that area. Interesting. Thank you, Mauricio. So, Stephen, depending on your application and technology, you may want to engage uh, both from me and our guy. Other questions folks have? Um, while we're waiting, I'll just ask another. Um, uh, this is a, a dumb question, but if someone wanted to visit uh, one of those labs just for, like, human interest, is there a way to do that? Obviously, uh, there's probably some COVID, uh, COVID, maybe COVID restrictions right now, but... Uh, is, is that possible? And, and what's the best way to do that, if so? Mauricio, you start us off. Okay. Um, so for, for Fermilab in, in the non-COVID um, time, if you have your smart ID, there's um, uh, the areas, for example, you can go and visit the, the bison um, and, uh, and you can go into, there's a, a building um, which is called Wilson Hall, and you can go in and, and look at some of the exhibits. Um, so yes, you, you can go in um, normally, um, uh, you know, outside COVID, you, could, you can go into Fermilab. Yeah, and, and Argonne's a little more restrictive, but it's really, um, it's really, again, just reaching out to, you know, somebody like Paulina or myself or, or a researcher as well. And, uh, you know, we can talk about what the interest area is and, uh, and again, with a smart ID, it's 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 relatively easy and non-COVID times uh, to uh, to get on uh, to get on site. Um, we were hoping to have a really great uh, open house uh, in 21 because if it's our 75th anniversary, um, I don't know what we're going to do in this virtual world to to celebrate that. But uh, we'll let people know that as well. And. Uh, and that may be another way to engage with the lab virtually, at least uh, in the near term. Excellent. And just to clarify, the smart ID, that's the, that's the ID that uh, allows you to fly on, you know, and go through uh, TSA and all that, that new, new version, not the old Illinois ID. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So that's your driver license now that has a special, you know, uh, check. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I think we just have time for a couple more questions uh, that came in, but uh, one from Shreesh just came in um, asking, like, what stage of company uh, labs are looking at for strategic uh, partnerships or if there is, like, a prototypical stage there? That's a, a great question. I would have to say that we have worked with companies of absolutely all sizes. Uh, it depends on what the nature of the project is uh, and what the appropriate source of funding for the project would be. Um, obviously, if, if a company wishes to come and sponsor directly work that gets done at the lab, um, that's, a, that's a pretty significant investment on the part of the company uh, because it needs to cover our effort and overhead and all that stuff. So that's probably more appropriate for a large company. But there is all, all forms of um, collaboration that can happen from the SBR grants where it, uh, companies tend to be small, they have to be small businesses and tend to be very early stage um, to uh, opportunities like the HPC for energy innovation program, that's a DOE funded program or the technology commercialization fund program. In those programs, we have worked with um, 
small companies that may have two, three full-time employees and be early stage, they just need to be, you know, appropriately incorporated and going concerns. Fantastic. So a broad range, but different applications. Absolutely. Might be different, different Absolutely. Companies. That makes sense. All right. Looks like we have one last question before we wrap up. And thanks for everyone's patience. I know we're a little bit over the hour. Uh, Jennifer was asking uh, about Argonne's work in the air capture market. I assume that that's direct air capture. Uh, let me know if that's not right, Jennifer, but uh, like direct air capture of uh, carbon dioxide. Yes. Okay. All right. We're on the right track. Uh, do you know if there's any work in, in, in that space? Yeah, that's that's a that's an excellent question. So uh, we actually have uh, an entire division that's focused on environmental sciences, and so in that uh, in that area, there is a lot of obviously uh, very topical, a lot of carbon capture uh, technology and research being done, both from looking at it from a soil and plant perspective as well as an air capture perspective. So uh, would be happy to make some connections and uh, and uh, you know sort of start the dialogue uh, in that space. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any other questions, but if uh, so, I think we will can move to wrap up. But uh, thank you again for everyone for participating. Uh, thank you, Paulina, John, and Mauricio for sharing your uh, knowledge here. You know, I have a soft spot uh, for the National Labs. I'm, I'm from the Chicago area originally because my dad worked at Fermilab. So glad to see all of the opportunities that uh, there is for commercialization activity and partnership there. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out uh, to the contacts uh, that were listed or to any of us. And uh, thank you again for your time today. Ian and Clean Energy, Trust, Clean Energy Trust, thank you guys so much for sponsoring. It was, uh, it was great to be a part of it. And, and uh, thanks again, everybody, for your time. Thanks. Likewise. Have a Thank good you. Evening, yeah, have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.